I don't have to tell you how topical this issue is, uh, given what's happening, the tragedy unfolding in Syria, given the specter of a wider regional conflict, uh, given what's going on around Gaza just the last couple of days. I haven't checked the headlines today. In a way, I'm afraid to check those headlines. Uh, some perennial issues having to do with Lebanon's role as a multi-denominational, multi-ethnic uh, state, uh, having to do with uh, security interests of the great powers, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, there is uh, a lot to, to discuss always, and particularly, I think you'll agree, uh, this week. And that's why I think we have such a great turnout. We're lucky to have with us um, Irina Popkova, who's now living in, in Beirut and can give us the perspective of someone experiencing the atmosphere there, the politics there on the ground, but who also brings a deep academic background to the subject matter. Uh, Arena is uh, now a Berkeley Center Research Fellow. Before that, um, way before that, she was a graduate student in our program in government, but over the last five years, uh, she's been teaching in the Department of International Relations and European Studies at Central European University. There and in fellowships at the Kennan Institute and at the Vienna Institute for Human Sciences, um, she's worked on issues of religion and politics broadly with a thematic focus in most of her work on Russia and the former Soviet republics. I'll just mention one of her publications, a great book that came out last year with Oxford University Press, uh, the, Oc the Orthodox Church and Russian Politics. So I recommend that to you. Today, obviously, she's going to be speaking uh, about the situation in Lebanon uh, and against the backdrop of some other research that she might uh, tell you about uh, having to do with, uh, in particular, the role of Christian minorities, religious minorities in that part of the world and relating that, of course, to the wider uh, international scene and what we see unfolding in the region today. So please join me in welcoming Irina Popkova. Thank you very much, Tom, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I have to say that most, much of the talk, at least until we get into Q&A, will be really be focused mostly on Lebanon itself. I mean, I, I will be speaking a bit about the broader context, but I think what is of interest to me and hopefully to the audience today is actually what's happening inside of Lebanon, because I think the picture that you might have from, um, if you watch CNN or BBC, is not necessarily the one that you actually see on the ground. So I thought it would be useful to talk about the empirical um, things on the ground in more detail today. Um, is, is, does this work, or can I step away from the microphone a bit? Stay, stay near it. Stay near it, OK. All right. Um, I want to begin with a very personal, um, and I hesitate to call it an anecdote, because it was actually kind of an anecdote um, connotes something happy and perhaps even funny. But I want to begin with a story that had a sort of tragic um, element to it, which was barely three weeks ago, on the morning of, of October 19th, which was a Friday. I left my very comfortable flat in a sort of upper middle class part of Be Beirut and um, took a trip to the Beka Valley, which is um, located very near the Syrian border, and which, as you may or may not know, is the area that now hosts somewhere around 100 thousand probably more Syrian refugees and I was going there because I happen to be um, among the other things I'm doing in Beirut I'm working part-time for a NGO that um, deals with helping Syrian mothers or refugee mothers um, provide nutrition for their children so that morning we had a field trip out to the Bekaa Valley and which was the first time that I'd actually gone out there and prior to this everyone my th my thoughts about going out to the Bekaa were very I would say ambiguous because anytime you mention the Bekaa Valley, people start to sort of shiver a little bit and say, well, you know, that's where, all, where Hezbollah is, is, you know, they'll kidnap you because you're a Westerner, right? And so I was, I was freaked out of it and I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And I remember having a sort of long debate with my fiance, Paul, who's in the second row here today about whether or not I should, I should go and somehow we decided that it was all right. So here I am going off to the Bekaa Valley. And I spent a very interesting morning and, after, and early afternoon um, interviewing Syrian refugees. And I'm not going to really um, talk about much about what I saw there right now because it's kind of a, I mean, it's important, but it's um, the larger story is more important. 
And so I'm returning in early afternoon thinking, well, that wasn't so bad. It was the Pica Valley. It was very, very pretty. I can actually show you a picture um, there. That's, it's a very verdant, lovely place. Um, and I was returning. I was thinking, well, this is wonderful. Maybe in the winter I'll come back to some of the wi wineries here because they have wonderful um, vineyards. And as I'm pulling back into Beirut, um, this is what I see. Um, just as I'm driving into Beirut um, that afternoon at 2.50 p.m. And of course, I'm looking at that. The driver is looking at this, and the other passengers in the car start to panic. The cell phones start going off. I don't speak Arabic, but all I could hear was plasticine, plasticine. And I thought, oh my gosh, plasticine happens to be a very um, vibrant square in the middle of um, eastern Beirut. It's a Christian area. Um, it's extremely commercial. It's wealthy. It's a very peaceful place. Um, not one where you would assume that anything bad would happen. And it's also a place I happen to go every Monday morning and every Saturday morning for a choir rehearsal with a choir that I sing in. So I cross this place on a regular basis. And so we realized immediately there was something very bad. And somehow by the time we, I got home, um, we turned on the radio and with my limited Arabic and my driver's limited English, we sort of, Mackie managed to convey to me that a car bomb had gone off at Place Sassine. And indeed, this is what the scene that um, you can see giving rise to all of that terrible smoke. And so I, by the time I arrived home, I turned on the TV. And, and by this point, um, within an hour, um, it becomes obvious why that car bomb went off. This was the assassination of um, one of Lebanon's um, highest security chiefs, General Wissam al Hassan, who's a very prominent Sunni leader. And that's his picture. That's actually the spot where he was assassinated. So that was my um, October 19th, kind of, in, which um, left me with all sorts of different um, impressions. But I thought I would begin with that, because um, this event was actually um, the impetus for a lot of the media conversation about how Lebanon is about to descend into civil war, because all of a sudden we have um, car bombs going off in Christian East, Be East Beirut. And um, so the specter of sectarian violence um, comes up immediately, right? And as I, as I said, CNN and BBC and pretty much every other um, news outlet that you could watch um, framed it in these terms. Um, and the fears that um, the car bombing would lead to a civil war were compound, compounded over the weekend immediately following the assassination of al-Hassan. Um, on the 20th of October, which was Saturday, um, angry Sunni protesters, because remember, this is a very important detail, al-Hassan was a Sunni leader. So Sunnis are all over the country blocking roads with burning tires. It's their, their sort of favorite protest method of, of the Lebanese, whether they happen to be Sunnis, Shiites, Christians, whoever, they love to burn tires. Um, this is the tires burning on the way to the airport, um, which I'm not sure exactly what the point of that is because there are back roads and people can still get to the airport, but the point is they try to block, yes. Um, as Paul did that following morning, actually. Made, so I know this. Um, from personal experience, um, that the car that this is it's a very effective picture, but it's not necessarily a very effective method. Of smell. Is it really okay? In any case, um, so on the twentieth, angry Sunnis were burning tires all over Lebanon, um, which of course meant that um, two things. First of all, it meant that it was somewhat hard to drive around, and second of all, it also raised fears that um, the people that um, the Sunnis were angry at, or of course the Shias, were going to somehow react to this violently and um, try to unblock the roads and, and clash and, and, and that Lebanon would descend into um, more sectarian violence. Right? Um, so that's Saturday. On Sunday morning, um, I wanted to go to the church that I usually go to. And um, it, as I was about to leave the house, the phone rang and my um, the choir director of the church said, you know what, um, we're, none of us are going because, you know, there were shootouts going on between the neighborhood where you are and the church. So I didn't go. Um, so in the morning, there you have these shootouts going on in the neighborhood right behind mine. And in the afternoon, you had the funeral of um, General Hassan, which began, as you can see, peacefully enough. So there was um, lots of, about 10,000 people gathered in, in downtown Beirut, um, very peacefully, um, in a dignified kind of way, um, mourning the death of, of al-Hassan. But then um, you would hope that they would mourn and peacefully disperse. But then um, irresponsible politicians got involved and started calling upon um, 
the government, which happens to be right now um, dominated by um, a sort of pro what's thought to be pro-Syrian, and, and I'll get back to this in a second, um, government. So the opposition politicians started demanding that the government resign, right? And in response to their demand that the government resign, the youth of um, the Sunni um, opposition who were gathered at the, at the funeral decided that it would be a good idea to go and storm the government offices, right? Um, not realizing that all they had were sticks and maybe metal bars and the army had, you know, guns and, and tear gas. So this was the scene in downtown Beirut on Sunday afternoon, um, which again gave impetus to this idea that some Syria, that Beirut is, you know, imploding and that Lebanon is about to have a civil war. Um, and as the weekend continued, um, the instability continued. This was sort of Sunday afternoon. Um, at the neighborhood behind me, you can see the, the Free Syria flag and an anti-Assad um, anti um, banner um, in, the, in the neighborhood. And there were shootouts between um, Sunni militants and the army. And here's the army patrolling this, this neighborhood behind mine. And so, ah, and, in the, and probably the worst thing that happened that weekend was that in the northern city of Tripoli, which is a border, on the border between Lebanon and Syria, you have um, clashing neighborhoods of pro-Assad and anti-Assad supporters um, battling it out in the streets. And you had several casualties, and the army had to go out and, and calm, calm them down. So here you have some images, of, an image of the army patrolling the streets of Tripoli. Um, and so to sum all of this up, for a tense 76 hours, Lebanon, Lebanon appeared to be poised on the edge of an abyss. Um, and the media emphasis on civil war in Lebanon was not entirely off base. Um, and here I would like to just tell you, give you an idea of the rest of the talk, which is part A is going to be a brief discussion of why the media was not entirely wrong about, Syri about Lebanon having the elements of a civil war um, creeping into it. And the second part of the talk will be, will be my optimistic um, assessment of why I think that um, despite all of the pr internal pressures and external pressures, Lebanon may actually resist the temptation to um, devolve into sectarian violence in any serious way um, in the near future. So that's just to give you a roadmap of, of what the rest of the talk will, will be. So first, some discussion of why the media is not entirely incorrect. Um, and this has to, everything to do with, of course, the relationship between Syria and Lebanon. Um, and I'd like to give you um, a sort of map image so you can have a sense of, of what we're talking about. So you can see um, Lebanon, it's, it's, it's very small. And you have Damascus about 50 kilometers from Beirut. And really, Lebanon is surrounded by Syria, with the exception of its southern border, which is a whole other set of problems which I'm not going to address today because it's a different um, aspect of all this. Um, so in short, it's about 50 kilometers from Beirut to, Beirut to Damascus, um, a little bit further to the north where you can see where there's the border between Syria and Lebanon, that's where Tripoli is, um, Homs, Aleppo, Hama, all of these cities that are in the media, in the news um, from, from Syria, they're all in, within a very easy driving distance from Beirut and from the Lebanese border. Um, the Beka Valley is kind of this sort of area bordering um, where you see the border on, on to the to the east um, between Beirut and, and between Lebanon and Syria. That's the Beka Valley, which is um, full of all sorts of militants and, and, and smugglers and, and all sorts of other dangerous things. So as you can see, <coughs> that's just visually we get a sense of the pressures that Lebanon is under based on its geography, right? Um, but the situation is even more complicated than, than that. Historically, um, Syria and Lebanon were both ruled for centuries by the Ottoman Empire. And after the collapse of the Ottomans in 1918, the French moved in and imposed their rule over both Damascus and Beirut in what was known as the French Mandate. So the borders within the French Mandate were very fluid. and there, and the identities of the people that inhabited it were also quite fluid until the 1940s when both Syria and Lebanon emerged as independent countries as part of the decolonization process in the aftermath of World War II. But even then, the politics of the two countries remained intertwined. In 1976, 
the Syrian army entered Lebanon on the request of one of the armed factions in the civil war that was raging in Lebanon from 1975. And after the civil war ended, the Syrian army stayed. And again, this, I don't want to get into a big, long discussion about the complications of the Syrian civil war because it's going to take, I don't know, five hours, and you may still not understand anything by the time I'm done discussing that. So um, the point of this is that the occupation of Lebanon after the war allowed the Syrians to dictate foreign policy and a substantial portion of domestic politics in Lebanon for 14 years um, until 2005. And the Syrians withdrew in 2005 in the wake of demonstrations sparked by the assassinations of Lebanon's popular ex-Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, whom's picture I will show you. Yes, you see on the upper right-hand corner, that's Rafiq Hariri. He was assassinated in 2005. And because he was an, considered to be an anti-Syrian politician, um, he was a Sunni Muslim, um, he was considered to be acting contrary to Syria's interest. And so there's a, a lot of still to this day speculation that it was the Syrians who killed him. And his death sparked massive demonstrations. People went out into the streets, and Syria actually had to withdraw from Lebanon. Um, but even though the Syria government ordered the troops out of Lebanon, it did not order out the well-developed Syrian intelligence network, which is still there. And it can still continues to meddle in domestic politics in Lebanon by maintaining influential relationships with Lebanese politicians and arranging for the assassinations <laughs> of anti-Syrian figures periodically. So, and especially between the period of 2005 and 2008, there were something like a dozen high-profile assassinations um, of people about, of about the rank as, the same rank as General um, Wissam al-Hassan. And that was actually the, one of the reasons that the assassination um, this October was so shocking was that the assassinations had stopped in 2008 and the Lebanese had had four years of no high-profile assassinations and thought that perhaps they were over that and the assassination of al-Hassan was sort of made people think very sadly that perhaps they were not. Um, furthermore, um, the ties between Lebanon and Syria are by no means only political. Um, as mentioned previously, both countries had been once part of the general geographical space of the Ottomans. And as late as the first half of the 20th century, national categories such as Lebanese or Syrian had very little meaning because family, tribal, and religious ties had much more weight. And they still do in some ways. These non-national ties spread like a web across the two countries, with many Syrians having relatives in Lebanon and vice versa. And the sectarian and tribal networks are similarly diffuse. For example, the um, Orthodox Church in Beirut owes its ecclesiastical allegiance to the Patriarch of Antioch, who is based in Damascus, but who also happens to have summer residences in the Lebanese mountains. And the same level of interconnection can be found among the other sects, especially the Sunni, Shiite, Druze, Druze and Alawite. So given all of that, um, despite the fact that the Syrian army is no longer there, the lines between the, the two countries have remained so strong that at times it is difficult to pinpoint where Syria ends and Lebanon begins. And that has everything to do as well with le um, the politics of both countries. So given these interconnections, it's not surprising at all that Syria's ongoing ch chaos has raised concerns about a possible spillover into Lebanon. And now there are two versions of the doomsday scenario, um, the doomsday scenario being that Lebanon will collapse. And the first has to do with the unfortunate reality that Syria's war is now being fought on in increasingly sectarian lines. And this scenario predicts that because Lebanon's religiously divided population is closely tied into Syria through the above mentioned religious networks, the Syrian violence will inevitably cause si Lebanon's sects to turn on each other as well. For example, the regime of Bashar al-Assad is supported by the Alawite population in Syria, I think we all know that, and Lebanon has a significant minority of Alawites living in, in Tripoli and around Tripoli. The opposition in Syria is largely Sunni, and Lebanon has a large Sunni population. It would therefore not be surprising if Lebanon's Sunnis turn on the Alawites, right? And indeed, as I mentioned before, the northern Lebanese city of Tripoli has seen episodes of extreme violence over the past year in which Sunni supporters of Syria's opposition have clashed with Alawite supporters of al-Assad. And s between, since last June, there have been somewhere in, in the realm of about 100 deaths related to this, um, these clashes in Tripoli. Um, so in a, in a very real sense, you could say there is a mini civil war going on in northern Lebanon, um, in Tripoli itself. Um, the second version of the doomsday scenario 
predicts that Bashar al-Assad will utilize Syria's remaining spy network in Lebanon in order to destabilize it, thereby strengthening his own position within Syria by widening the war. And this scenario has its roots in Lebanon's domestic politics. If you remember, the murder of Rafik Hariri led to a creation in 2005 um, led to the creation of a political bloc composed, opposed to Syrian dominance over Lebanon. And it's known as, for reasons that I won't get into here, the bloc is known as March 14th and is composed of, at the moment, 18 political parties and is headed by Rafiq Hariri's son, Saad, who is the picture in the middle, um, who, up until, who actually for the last year has been sort of hiding out in France. But in any case, he's still considered to be the leader of March 14th. Um, and until from 2005 until January 2011, this coalition of March 14th held control over the cabinet of ministers. Um, and essentially what this meant is that you had an, a very pro-American, very anti-Syrian government in power in Lebanon until, un, until January of 2011. Um, then along comes January 2011, and um, as is often the case in Lebanese politics, um, there's, there's, there's a conflict and another alliance controlled by, which is an alliance of 14 parties known as March 8th, and this is over here, um, came to power and is now ruling over Lebanon. And also its only distinguishing characteristic from the March 14th is that it's considered to be pro-Syrian, right? Um, they're equally pro-American, actually, <coughs> or mostly pro-American, aren't they? No, or at least they're not, you look shocked. Not openly, not openly, openly primary. They're pro. No, no. Let me put it. Let me put it this way. Mikari is not the rest of them are. Yes. Well, yes. I know. I was going to get to Hezbollah. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, broadly speaking, so that's that's the differences. Um, so the second doomsday scenario predicts that the Syrian government has and will continue to engage in provocations within Lebanon meant to spark a civil war between the followers of March 8th and March 14th. And when I meant pro-American, I meant basically pro-business, right? That's sort of a broader category for that. Um, so in any case, the assassination of Wissam al-Hassan plays into both of these predictions for civil war in Lebanon. Al-Hassan was a prominent member of the Sunni community and had in the past been in charge of security for Rafiq Hariri. He had spearheaded the investigation into Hariri's assassination which is broadly believed to have been carried out by Hezbollah on the behest of the Syrian government. Al-Hassan was open in his condemnation of the Syrian regime's brutality since the beginning of the civil war in Syria. And more importantly, into September 2012, Al-Hassan's security agency had outed a spy ring allegedly led by a prominent March 8th politician. And this spy ring was linked with the Syrian government and was accused of bringing explosives into Lebanon with the intent of destabilizing the country. So thus, al-Hassan's assassination was immediately interpreted by many observers as Bashar al-Assad's revenge and a warning to those March 14th Lebanese who may sympathize with the Syrian rebels. It was also interpreted as an act of violence directed specifically at the Sunni community. And um, in that sense, going back to the events of the weekend of October 19th, 20th, and 21st, um, there were certainly elements of um, of this um, second scenario because you can see here um, in the back sort of free Syria uh, uh, flags and in the, in the front these blue ones, these are uh, blue flags of the future movement which is one of the groups within March 14th and these were demonstrators in front um, during the funeral of Wissam al-Hassan. So the link between sort of the Syrian rebels um, or sympathy for the Syrian rebels and March 14th is quite visual. Um, is quite strong, um, both visually and in, in reality. And here's another scene. You have, um, again, the same, the same event, the uh, funeral of, of al-Hassan. And you have sort of free Syria flags, Lebanese flags, and, and, and March 14th flags. Um, and in fact, um, when I mentioned the violence that was going on in the neighborhood behind mine that weekend, it was the Lebanese army um, fighting against militants linked to March 14th. So. Um, and if you think that um, of the Lebanese army as representing the interests of the Lebanese government, which is you know, considered to be somewhat pro-Syrian, then you have the sort of pro-Syrian Lebanese army um, battling anti-Syrian um, March 14th forces. But it's more complicated than this, but that's 
one reason why um, this argument that Lebanon is on its way towards civil war actually has some basis in um, empirical um, realities. And the final um, element in this case for a Lebanese civil war has to do with the fact that the Hassan assassination was only the latest in a string of security incidents that began about June 2011. Um, and as I mentioned before, it um, has been focused mostly around Tripoli, but not only Tripoli, um, in which there have been um, intersectarian violence and um, kidnappings and all sorts of unpleasant events, which have, as I mentioned before, led to about um, at least 100 people um, being killed since then. Um, some of it also having to do with the fact that um, the Lebanese army tends to chase rebels over the Le Lebanese border, so you have you know, those incidents of violence going on as, as, as well on a fairly regular basis, um, partly because the Lebanese army is not really out patrolling the Lebanese border because it doesn't have the capacity to do that. So here we have the case for Lebanon's spilling into some kind of um, terrible and awful conf conflagration. However, um, I still think, and I would like to conclude this talk with um, a discussion of why I think so, that at least in the medium term and the short term, um, Lebanon will avoid a, a civil war and has managed to do so up until now. And I think there, the elements that have prevented it from collapsing are still there and strong enough to, um, to continue, provided, of course, and this will be the last point of my talk, provided, of course, that they get a certain amount of um, support from the American and European governments um, in their uh, current endeavors to avoid, um, avoid war. Um, certainly, the doomsday scenario was on the mid minds of most Lebanese immediately after the explosion on, March on October 19th. And the normally bustling streets of Beirut were eerily empty for two days, um, as many of the city's shocked residents felt it prudent to wait and see how, to what, how what people were euphemistically referring to as the situation would develop. Right? Yet by Tuesday, um, which was October 22nd, life had basically returned to normal. Um, today, Beirut is once more a city of overflowing bars, happening cafes, thriving businesses, and log-jammed traffic. If you go out on a Saturday night in Beirut, it looks like Miami Beach. I mean, it's, it's that intensely full of people out partying. Um, talk of civil war is no longer um, sort of on the tip of people's, on the top of people's minds, and it's restricted to those international media channels which haven't entirely forgotten about it in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and the American election and other things that have, you know, captured their imagination since then. So barely a few weeks after the assassination of General al-Hassan, the Lebanese themselves have moved on and the threat of civil war seems to have receded. And what explains this? One popular explanation, I would say, emphasizes the memories of the devastating civil war that ended barely two decades ago in 1990. Um, in this highly divided society, one unifying national idea can be heard over and over again, no matter who you talk to that nobody wants to descend into the dark hole of sectarian strife that killed 100,000 people or more last time around. The Lebanese are only too well aware of the costs of civil war, both physical and financial. And I actually would argue that this problem might even be the more important element of this. The government has consequently, um, even under this sort of anti American um, March 8th, they've consequently followed a consistent policy of dissociating Lebanon from serious chaos. Um, admittedly, the path has not been easy for the reasons enumerated before, um, but the official policy is one of dissociation, that Lebanon will not get involved in this. And the experience of the Lebanese civil war almost certainly plays a role in the mindset of the country's governing elite as well. Several of the political parties are led by men who were, in their past lives, um, leaders of militias and fought each other on the field of battle in the 15-year period from 1975 to 1990. So, for example, um, General Michel Owen, pictured here on the, on the right, um, and um, General Samir um, Jaja, um, pictured here on the left, um, had once um, led Christian militias into battle in the 1980s. Um, today, they each had their own political party in Lebanon's p parliament. Uh, Awun is part of March 8th, and uh, Jaja is part of March 14th. Um, then there's Walid Jumblat, who um, is pictured on the upper left here, um, who is the powerful leader of the Progressive, Social Nas Progressive Socialist Party. He once led the Druze militia um, in the Civil War and is famous for saving the cedars of Lebanon by 
putting mines around them during the war to prevent them from being destroyed. That's kind of his biggest accomplishment during the war, I would say. Um, and even though and he is, himself is, at the moment, probably one of the most popular pol politicians or one of the most powerful politicians in Lebanon and is considered to be a kingmaker of sorts. Um, and though they both um, fought on opposing sides during the war, these men and others like them have subsequently spent 20 years working out their political differences in peaceful ways as part of a pluralistic democratic system, um, which for all of its flaws seems to have worked relatively well up until now. And so for now it seems that they continue to they intend to continue doing so, but particularly since political po power in Lebanon is linked with wealth and the possibilities of enrichment in a society that's rebuilding itself from a civil war are still um, quite large. And actually this was something where, um, that came up in a conversation maybe about two weeks ago, that if there is a new civil war, um, who's going to benefit once it's, you know, at some point it will have to come to an end as well, right? And so you will have to have another period of reconstruction. Who's going to benefit from it? Well, downtown Beirut is owned by the Hariri family, so if there's another civil war, guess who's going to be making the millions and billions of dollars once, you know, if there is another civil war once, in, once we get to the cleanup stage. So that's also not in the interest of people who might not want Hariri to make more money than the family already has, right? So given all of this, um, the question comes up, um, is this balance sustainable, the balance that I just mentioned? And answering this question um, and it requires a somewhat deeper analysis of the two opposing blocks that dominate the scene here, March 8th and March 14th. Um, usually, and actually this is sort of accurate, um, March 8th is seen as representing the Shiites and, the, and March 14th is seen as being dominated by Sunnis, right? And which is why the assassination of Al Hassan sparked fears that you know the Shiites would and Sunnis would clash with uh, militarily. But a closer look at the composition of the blocks reveals that both parties are made up of Christians, Sunnis, Druze, Shiites, and secularly oriented political parties. So even though uh, obviously March 8th is dominated by the Shiite Hezbollah and March 14th is dominated by you know some Sunni parties, but the other part. But there are actually Shiite parties on the side of March 14th, and there are actually Sunni parties on the side of March 8th. And the same thing is true for the Christians, the Alawites, and the Armenians, and the secular parties. So when you actually look at it, it turns out that Lebanon is, is not only split along sectarian lines, but the sects themselves are divided in terms of their attitude towards a whole host of political issues, including the question of Syria. Um, and of course, you also have, um, in the mix, you have thrown in the Palestinians, who are also divided between, you know, pro-Syrian Palestinians, anti-Syrian Palestinians. So the supreme fragmentation of Lebanese political interests means that none of the parties involved, with one important exception, are strong enough to hypothetically win militarily should there be a civil war. And so sober calculation therefore has led the leaders of the various parties to avoid escalating the situation, preferring to resolve this, the, their differences through backroom deals. And the important exception, of course, is Hezbollah, which is primarily the reason why March 8th is rightly considered to be anti-American. Um, and it is led by um, Syed Hassan Nasrallah, who's pictured on the left with this um, machine gun. Um, and the thing about Hezbollah is that um, at the end of the Civil War in Lebanon, all of the militias were disarmed except Hezbollah. Hezbollah got to keep its weapons. And that's the central political problem in Lebanon today, what to do about the fact that Hezbollah still has its weapons and also wants to um, um, eventually, if they can, um, rule over Lebanon as a Shiite uh, theocracy, right? Um, until relatively recently, um, this, this, well, and it actually, it still is the central question. Um, and in fact, um, to, give, to go back just a little bit, to give you a kind of better understanding of, of what's happened here, um, the assassination of Hariri in 2005 was cons um, resulted in the formation of a UN special tribunal, um, which was supposed to investigate um, the assassination. And, this, and the tribunal has actually come, down, come out with um, indictments where they're, they've named um, members of Hezbollah as having had to do with the Hariri as assassination. And the, the way in which March 8th, March 8th came to power had to do with those indictments because when, when the special tribunal um, was about to announce um, the results of its investigation, at that point, 
Saad Hariri was the prime minister leading March 14th. And he made the mistake, I think, of, coming to, of choosing that particular moment to come to the United States to meet with um, Barack Obama. And while he was away, um, basically Hezbollah engineered his ouster, um, ha fearing that if, if Hariri uh, stayed in power, then, then, the March 8, then the special tribunal would um, be able to continue its work in such a way that would really um, politi politically damage Hezbollah. So um, that is how we ended up with, with um, Hezbollah as backing March 8th's um, political ascendancy. Right? Um, and in fact, this is sort of, uh, I'm coming to the end of the, the talk and I can d digress briefly into another personal anecdote. I remember in um, January of 2011, um, I was at a very far part of the world, I think somewhere in Singapore, I forget, either between Singapore or Bangkok or somewhere. And I was watching um, BBC and the Lebanese were, were out burning tires and the Lebanese government had just fallen and Paul and I had this big long conversation about whether or not Paul would actually be going back to Lebanon because, you know, it looked like there was going to be a civil war. And then within a week, um, somehow all of that calmed down and the attention of the world went to Tunis, Tunisia, and Egypt. And the actual, the sort of Arab revolutions began there. And Lebanon, strangely enough, actually um, went back to a sort of status quo and remained as one of the more or less stable, well, in quotes, um, places in the Middle East for the next year and a half. So in any case, um, to wrap this up, the fact that Hezbollah has its own army, right, while the others, at least officially, don't, this would give Hezbollah a significant advantage in the event of a civil war. And should it win such a conflict, hypothetically, as I mentioned, it would institute a Shiite Islamist regime aligned with Iran. And this is an outcome that none of the other parties want, um, whether or not they're really, um, particularly March 14th, but um, also some of the March 8th parties are not really thrilled with that idea either. So all of this adds to more weight to the argument against sectarian violence, that there are too many people interested in it not happening. And finally, um, Hezbollah itself actually has been noticeably restrained um, since the beginning of the Syria conflict um, until actually this weekend. But um, all of this is counterintuitive because you would expect a strong ally of the Assad regime to do all it could to generate support for the Syrian government. But what the war means for, Sy for Hezbollah is that it's no longer able to rely on arms shipments through Iran. So, um, because they'd gone through Syria traditionally, so all of the, so the war in Syria has actually meant that, Leba, that Hezbollah is militarily weakened, which means that it also has every interest in not um, exacerbating the situation. And finally, I'm not sure exactly how much time I have, but um, um, there are two um, final elements that are um, balancing out the situation in Lebanon. And the, fir the first of these um, is the Lebanese army. I mentioned before that the Lebanese army um, was relatively weak after the um, end of the civil war. And in fact, this was one of the justifications for Hezbollah um, existing in order to protect, or so they say, to protect Hezbo uh, Lebanon from Israel. But since 2006, thanks to an infusion of um, weapons from the United States, um, the Lebanese army has actually become much stronger. And what was really interesting in the events of uh, late of mid-October was watching how quickly the army was able to put down sectarian clashes throughout the country. So the second you had um, militias running out to burn tires, the Lebanese army was out there removing them and forcing the militias back into their homes and out of the streets. So, um, and in fact, the Lebanese army command came out and said that they um, in what I think was a very interesting quote, they said that um, they will not allow the assassination of al-Hassan um, result in the assassination of Lebanon itself, and they've been actually doing a very professional job of, of um, ensuring that. Um, and finally, um, I would say the, the element that is very actually perhaps even more important in Lebanon's um, continued um, unstable stability is the fact that despite all of this, the economy is still growing. Up until 2011, it was growing at the rate of something well above 5% a year. Um, Lebanon never experienced the um, mortgage crisis because they had a very smart central banker who, in 2002, um, outlawed the this, this sale of uh, um, trading of mortgage-backed securities. So um, the cri crisis of 2008 really didn't hit Lebanon from that side. Um, it still has some of the most expensive uh, real estate in the world. Um, 
And there are also other factors driving the Lebanese economy's success. And even now, I mean, it's, it's gone down considerably. I think it's re in 2012, it grew maybe at 1, 1.2 percent, but still it's not in recession. And there is still some hope that it will continue to, to remain above water. And so the essential point of this is there are a lot of people making lots of money in Lebanon, and they're not really interested in sectarian um, clashes and religious reasons leading it leading to a um, to to the loss of profits basically I mean and, and so because I suppose you have the Lebanese are known, well known for being a merchant society and perhaps that's what's kind of at the heart of their um, managing to avoid um, civil war up until now and finally um, that's, so I had a big, nice picture of the Lebanese army being all successful and um, before I finish, I just wanted to um, add a sort of funny, well, maybe not so funny, um, set of pictures. Um, when we were down south in, in Lebanon, the city of Tyre, you have these beautiful Roman ruins. Um, it's a Roman uh, the hippodrome. <laughs> hippodrome, yes. It's a hippodrome. And so you can't see it here, but to the right of it, you have these high rises, right? And so I was looking at it, and I saw you can see on top of the high rise, you have these sort of guys up on top of the roof. And as I was watching this, it became very clear after watching this for about five minutes that what you had was Hezbollah militants training, you know, rappelling up and down on these <laughs> roofs. So this is the unstable Lebanese South, which we can talk about in Q&A because I think I'm coming to the, to the end of the, the talk. Um, so on the one hand, you have this unstable um, Lebanese South, but on the other hand, you have a, an image with which I'd like to finish, which is Biblos, which is um, perhaps half an hour north of uh, Beirut, and it's the uh, city that has had been inhabited the longest in the history of our planet. Um, you've had a city there for 8,000 years, and somehow when I look at this and when I look at the um, view of the Mediterranean, you know, in the city where you have Roman ruins and Phoenician ruins and Crusader castles, and you think, you know, this is a, this is a society, a country that has actually in various forms survived for 8,000 years, and somehow one has faith that perhaps it will survive um, despite what BBC and CNN tell us about Lebanon's near future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Irina, uh, for that wide-ranging presentation. And I usually don't thank people for optimistic conclusions, but um, in this case, uh, it's, it's wonderful that you've come to one uh, through an argument that brings together sort of the legacy of the, the Civil War, the balance of power within and across the political and religious forces, and then you mentioned toward the end uh, the power, this authority of the central state, the army, the importance of the business sector, um, and then you, in, in a kind of rousing way, uh, invoked a, a faith in the future based on longevity uh, with the past and the co continuity um, that, that, we've, that we've seen against all expectations in Lebanon over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I'm sure, though, that there will be some questions, some challenges, people who might not share your optimism, people who may disagree with one or another uh, of your points, points of view, given the very uh, controversial nature and the complex nature of the conflict. So we have about 20, 25 minutes for general discussion. And um, what I'd ask you to do, there's a mic that, that's roving around. If you ra raise your hand, I'll identify uh, you, and you could stand up and maybe introduce yourself, pose a question, and we'll just see where the, the conversation takes us. So we got a question here. We'll start with one at a time, and if, if they multiply, we can bundle them. All right. Hi, my name is Graham Wisner. Um, have long time uh, history in Lebanon, know and love it as you clearly do. The election's coming up uh, in the new year and um, a group of, of candidates are vying and uh, in the backdrop of everything you've said, who do you think is uh, the most formidable candidates and where do they come from, which sex and groups and are there any dark horses in the crowd? Oh, um, well, as with everything in Lebanon, it's a very complicated question to answer. Um, I would guess, I'm not sure, I think if March 14th had sort of shown itself more responsible in the immediate aftermath of Al-Hassan's assassination, then they probably would have had a, a very big chance of, of coming out as the winner in the upcoming elections. Um, I'm not sure that they necessarily show themselves to be really responsible, at least in the early days. So 
but it, but given that it's hard to predict because obviously the fact that um, the assassination happened, I think March eighth is somewhat less popular now, so it's hard to it's hard to guess. I, d I, I don't know. I have, I have to say. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Lucanois. I'm a professor at the American University of Beirut. I think uh, the more interesting thing would be to ask what, what's Jumblat's role going to be. Yeah, I was and actually going to say that. The reason why the March 14th coalition fell last year was that Jumblat switched sides. Right, uh, and he, he seems he that he's switching back again. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's angrily oh. condemned Syria, uh, the, the Assad regime in Syria, and he's also called for McCarthy's resignation. Mm. And it seems like he might come back. Uh, what do you think, uh, having done your research? Yeah, I, I actually, that was going to be a because I didn't know exactly how detailed you wanted to, me to be, but my initial sort of mental reaction was to your question was Jumblat, basically, is, is the deciding factor. And it's, you know, basically, if Jumblat does throw all of his support behind March 14th, then March 14th has a much bigger chance, I think, of, of, um, at, of no longer being in the opposition, let's put it that way. Hi, I'm Joseph Cibeli with the Lebanese Information Center, and I've been involved in Lebanese politics since I was in Lebanon and then now in Washington. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your presentation. This is a very unique one. And of course, I share, uh, I share your point of view, but it's, as you said, it's very rare to see people being optimistic, but what you said is absolutely true, and it's based on, on facts and, and, uh, and well-done research. Um, I, one aspect that you mentioned, which related to your optimism, by the way, is you know what does drive the Lebanese away from the return to civil war or some, some from the civil war itself? And actually, as you probably know, even many many Lebanese today refuse to call it civil war. They call it sometimes the war of others mm -hmm. on our land. So um, you mentioned something like you know the the fear of the return of the war. Um, there's some other aspect that I always felt was existent in Lebanon, which is the the interest of Lebanese in, in politics. And Lebanon, of course, has a long tradition in democracy and, and party politics, unlike the rest of the Arab world. And Lebanese love politics. And obviously, that's a way, sometimes, away from violence. Mm -hmm. But can you identify other factors that would, again, steer the Lebanese away from falling into violent conflicts again? Uh, I mean, there, there are those small violent incidents you mentioned. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I throw something in along those lines? What about uh, sort of national identity? Is that a category that's useful here as a frame, <coughs> framework for helping to understand? And maybe you can respond to I that after we hear from Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, Go yeah. ahead, Irina. I have some um, comment on this. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, you know, I think actually um, one thing which you actually bring up is this question of Lebanese identity, because I, d I did some research last summer among students in Lebanon, uh, asking them about you know the relationship between their uh, their religious sect and their national identity and how they see themselves, and for the majority of them, I would say actually probably 99 percent, all said you know the the sects that's they're just political labels. We're all Lebanese. We want to be Lebanese. We you know want Lebanon to be one united country, um, and that when you talk about religion, what you're really talking about is clan and family, and that it's not you know just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm going to go you know go go kill you know, Muslims and vice versa. So I think that that's one um, important thing. This was students, um, though, this, right? this, this was students, but, these are, but what's important is these, these were students at the American University of Beirut who are eventually going to be the political elite of Lebanon, or s most of them anyway. So um, I think that that's, uh, that's important. Um, the other thing, um, actually, that I just, it, it, it'll come to me in a moment. I actually had another response to it, I have to I think, yeah, I think the, the issue of national identity is definitely a factor. And again, had, having lived the war in Lebanon, I realized that, you know, in the war there was this, this whole, and, and really what led in part to the war with the involvement of, for example, the Palestinian, the PLO, and others in the war, mm -hmm. is the sense among Lebanese that, uh, uh, that maybe, maybe we don't belong here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we always, that's something that, I'm, I mean, I'm a Christian, and, and there was always this idea about the Sunni Muslim maybe not feeling that this is their place, that Lebanon is their place, that they would, you know, demonstrate for Nasser or for Arafat, but not maybe for Lebanese issues. And this has changed, mm -hmm. I mean, to your point. And, you know, I heard Saad Hariri 
saying that 2005 was the true independence. Some people call it independence too, that the Sunni now feel that they're true Lebanese. And even Nasrallah and Hezbollah with a totally Iranian agenda, I mean, you can tell from his speeches, every once in a while he wants to say it. You feel like he needs to say it, that, yeah, yeah, but we're Lebanese. You know, mm -hmm. we do this for Iran, that we believe in this big agenda. But no, 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 we work for Lebanon. So the, the, oh, sure. the sense of national identity, and, and as you said before, I mean, the, the, various sec the various Lebanese believe that there is no contradiction between having strong feeling of belonging to a Christian or Sunni or Shia, and at the same time being Lebanese, or being first Lebanese, but also belonging to a sect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Uh, in the spirit of making this a conversation, who doesn't agree with that? Uh, who doesn't agree with the optimistic picture that arenas, so we can have a civil conversation, uh, or is the evidence really overwhelming, overdetermined, we'd say, that despite all the, the tensions and the pressures, Lebanese democracy, uh, civil society will persevere? Are, are there any skeptics who'd like to provide counter arguments? Can I argue with myself? Well, let's let someone else argue with you first in the back, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Daniel Fullerton with Public International Law and Policy Group. It's not so much a disagreement, just another route for further destabilization. You mentioned that the most recent assassination was that first after mm -hmm. a four-year dry spell. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we see another string of these eight or nine high-profile assassinations over a couple years, more condensed as sectarian violence increases in neighboring Syria, that's another opportunity for a couple more of these smaller skirmishes to escalate um, and mm -hmm. just continue to fall through, especially with the continuing expansive Syrian intelligence operations within Lebanon. Oh, sure. But I mean, I, I think the last point, though, I mean, I think as the Assad regime weakens, I mean, so will the intelligence serv services within Lebanon. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to be able to do much with them, you know, given, given time. Hi, my name is Kevin Morrow, and um, I'm a freelance writer. I have a question. You know, you mentioned um, you mentioned that there are s uh, many, many f uh, factions and forces in Lebanon that have a vested interest in not allowing things to collapse into civil war. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, one question I have is, how much control over their own people do the leaders of each faction actually have in Lebanon? I mean, how mm -hmm. how much power do they actually have to make sure that that does not happen? You know, I think it varies, but my general impression, and here I come, this is sort of imp an impressionistic answer, but I think they have, they do control their people relatively well. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially because of what I mentioned before with the sex being tied into family and clan and, and all of that leading to, you know, elections basically mean jobs for Lebanese, you know, so whoever you vote for, you know, there's a strong chance that you might get a job through because of the vote you cast. So there are, are, are these interests as well. I think the, especially somebody like Walid Jumblat or um, Saad Hariri, then the sort of loyalty of their people to them are, are quite strong, I would say. So another reason for optimism. Paul, yeah. did you want to jump in? Yeah. Or, uh, a, part where we, a part where we could really see that was after the assassination of Wissam al-Hassan. Uh, when the March 14th crowd came out and demonstrated very strongly against the government, tried to storm. Mm -hmm. And um, the March 14th leadership came out and pretty much. Mm -hmm. Hours. Mm -hmm. it, w it was over. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and actually, the fact that I think the, the March 8th leadership clearly told the sort of the Shiite side that not to not to react to the provocations and not to sort of. Um, and join the s March 14th militias in battle, you know, to, st to stay out of it, to stay home. And, yeah, yeah I I exactly. So Nasrallah condemns the assassination, the Shiites stay home, basically. So, yeah, I think, I think th that's true. Could, could we try to um, regionalize or even internationalize the conversation a little bit? And can you say something about, say, Iran and the United States and Israel, perhaps, uh -huh. as players in, in this, in the context of the Syrian civil war and what it means for, for Lebanon? Um, I can try. Um, I think what, what's, to me, the most interesting thing about this is the sort of silence about the Israeli part of this. Um, even within Le Lebanese media, it's just not discussed because Israel, I mean, you, I, mean I, I don't know what those of you who live in Lebanon or have been there, if you've experienced the same thing, but you don't talk about Israel. You talk about the Zionist entity. You talk about Disneyland. You talk about, you know, some our, neighbors, our, our neighbors to the south. You don't speak the words Israel, despite the fact that, you know, there are Israeli warplanes going over my house periodically. You know, you just don't talk about it. You know? um, 
so Israel, um, it's and the interesting thing actually about the, the Al Hassan assassination was that Hezbollah came out and said, well, you know, it wasn't us, it was the Israelis, because, you know, um, Hassan was outing Israeli spy rings, which is true, he was, <laughs> right? So, and, and, and not that I want to give for any particular credence to Hezbollah, but, you know, there, there's a sort of question that, question mark there, you know, about, about that. But, um, um, so the Israeli role, I have to say, is, is sort of mysterious and, and, and not, it's, it's there, but it's very hard to pinpoint exactly what it is. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of um, international um, other, Iran in, particular. Iran in particular, well, Iran has a problem because they can, you know, since Syria is in, a, in this civil war, I mean, they can't really ship their weapons to Hezbollah with it as easily as they could before, so um, this, this has weakened them, I think. Um, um, they're, they're just not able to physically sort of continue that connection. Um, and I think, it's, as I said before, it's very clear that Hezbollah has kind of stepped back its rhetoric because of that, because um, as, as far as the United States is concerned, I, I don't know. I have a sort of interesting, um, it's a question I've asked myself because obviously, you know, you live there and you know that there is, you know, American CIA agents there sort of somewhere, right? But if you want to go there officially as a U.S. government employee, you can't, right? I've had several friends of mine who want to come visit me. They, they're not allowed to come and see me. Why? Because Beirut is dangerous and we don't want, you know, to put Americans in danger, even though I feel safer walking the streets of Beirut than I do walking the streets of Washington. You know, it's it's an area. You know, so so I think, and I, and, and if you go to the American embassy, pe the pe the people who work for the American embassy there, they're they're hiding in the compound. They don't go outside and and, and, and sort of associate with the, with the people of Lebanon. So I think the. Um, which is why you had the you know freaked out reaction after the um, after the um, assassinations in Benghazi, where the Lebanese the embassy in, in Beirut was burning documents because they were afraid they were next. No, nobody was going to really go storm the American embassy in, in Beirut, you know. Um, but um, at the same time, it's so I would say in terms of the American involvement. On the one hand, they've had a positive involvement in the sense that they, as I mentioned before, they strengthened strengthen the Lebanese army, and I think they really should continue to do that. The problem with that is that I, I read some um, analysis of um, Lebanese um, uh, writers about this, about, about the army situation, is that, yeah, they're strengthening the Lebanese army, but they have the problem that Lebanon is still technically at war with Israel. So they can't give the Lebanese army weapons that are going to help it actually, you know, um, be stronger against Israel, which means that they're not able to strengthen them enough to the point where they can actually ensure security throughout the entire country, leaving Hezbollah to, you know, to do what it's doing, right? So, um, and this is, I, w I wanted to mention this before, thank you for reminding me, I think that one way in which the United States could potentially contribute to the situation in Lebanon is just basically step up its military assistance and step up at also um, aid in terms of, you know, helping Lebanon deal with the 100,000 Syrian refugees. Right. Yes, jump back in. I just want to add one other issue. You, as you look at the United States, there are uh, Treasury and Justice have been out in Lebanon looking very hard at the backbone of Lebanese society, the banking system. Mm -hmm. And they have in their power the ability to make the Lebanese banking sh system shake. And if they make oh, it okay. shake, uh, at the end of the day, the very economic backbone of Lebanon would disappear. So how the United States and various groups in the United States that are after Iranian assets and others um, deal with this nuanced issue is going to be critically important to the economic future of Lebanon. That, that, that's true, but there's also this sort of, we have Lebanese friends with assets who we've asked about this question. They said, well, you know, if they start making us, um, you know, uh, disclose our assets, well, there's always safety de safe deposit boxes, right? Like, we're not going to, you know, so that I think the Lebanese, as perhaps because of their, you know, centuries-long merchant, um, mentality, they, they may find ways around that. I don't know. The, the problem is that there's a diaspora outside yeah, that, that's which true. sends its money back, and they are still very much influenced by, by how oh, the sure. whole flow of capital is restricted. Yeah. And if they withdraw their support mm -hmm. from other Lebanon, then there could be really serious long term. That, that, that's, that's true, actually. Yeah. And, and I have to say that that is one of, you know, if I'm arguing against myself, I think that's one of the things that is important. Like, 
the economy and because it is despite the fact that it's still growing it's slowed down significantly so and people are, are becoming angrier and angrier as that happens so yeah so in academics too we argue with ourselves uh, yeah. <laughs> any other any other questions one more up here hi I'm my name is Jyothi Pocha I'm a uh, master student at uh, security studies here at Georgetown mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could speak of if there's any existential threats to the state of Lebanon and if so is Syria one of them the conflict that's going on there well um, I would say yes of course and I think the whole point of this talk is that despite these very real existential threats somehow Lebanon's managed to sort of keep its ship of state afloat despite all of this very very real threats and um, I don't want to by any means, um, and I hope you don't come away from this talk thinking that I think that everything is rosy and wonderful and that Lebanon is not in any danger. Of course it is. And I think what is remarkable is the extent to which it's managed to avoid actually hitting the very serious rocks that are on its path, right? The fact that it's managed not to collapse um, despite all of these external and internal pressures, I think, is, is what's remarkable and what I think I wanted to talk about. But yes, I agree. I mean, the, the the threats to its existence are, are very real. Um, just one example, I mean, t I mean, as I was preparing this talk, I mean, I had to look at what's been happening in Lebanon over the last few days, and right now you have um, this um, looming sort of Shiite-Sunni confrontation in Sidon, because Sidon, of course, is the um, town that's the headquarters of Hezbollah, and there's a Salafist sheikh there who's a member of the Sunni, um, was he's allied with the Sunnis, and He's come out, he has come out and said, you know, I don't want, I, I think it's wrong that Hezbollah, you know, controls my city and I want them out of here, right? And, you know, has started, his supporters have started blocking roads and this is actually a really big deal because, um, you know, dislodging Hezbollah from a place where they've been for ages and ages and ages, it's not something that the Salafist Sheikh by himself is going to be able to do, right? But still he feels the need, the, somehow the impulse to, to um, to do this, which is actually at the moment, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I thought, you know, I have to somewhere mention that, you know, all optimism aside, you know, the Lebanese South at the moment is extremely unstable and dangerous, right? Um, but yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Arena. It's great. To you have one question. Okay. Final question here. My name is Ben Hawk, uh, ST International. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned the you mentioned the international aspect. Yeah. And you mentioned the Salafi. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the, because no one mentioned Saudi Arabia, or maybe I missed it uh -huh. at the beginning, but do you believe that there's a connection between the Salafis and the uh, Saudi Arabian? Yeah, actually, actually, that's another interesting thing, which I wasn't sure where to add this, but now that you mention it, um, one threat to the Lebanese economy also happens to be the, um, to come from the fact that over the past couple of years, one of the reasons Lebanon's economy has grown so fast has been that you've had Saudi and Gulfi Arabs coming to Lebanon, um, you know, to eat, drink, and be merry in the summer. Um, and um, because of a certain, because there were several kidnapping incidents, um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and several of the Gulf states have sort of told their citizens to stop going as tourists to Lebanon, which has De in many ways derailed the, the economic growth because the, the um, hotels are no longer full, the beaches are no longer hopping. And part of that, there is an idea that part of the reason that the Saudis have done that is because they um, are actually, um, you know, b because of this larger Saudi-Iranian conflict and because the March 8th government is seen as a sort of pro-Syria, pro-Iran government, then the Saudis, you know, want to destabilize it by telling their citizens not to go and invest in Lebanon anymore, right? Um, so yeah, and, and the Salafist, I don't know, I haven't actually been able to find a connection between, the, you know, the, the, the Salafist sheikh and Sidon and Saudi Arabia, but I think in the larger context, I think you're right, there is, there is a connection of some sort. Well, Rena, this is, uh, we have one more question here. I hate to leave questions on the table. All right, one more. This is the last question. Hi. Uh, my name is Nar Shechem. I'm a Jordanian American. Mm -hmm. Two days ago at the Woodrow Wilson Center, former Lebanese Prime Minister Fouad Senora mm -hmm. said that uh, uh, he's confident that Saad Hariri will be back in Lebanon before the end of the year. Uh -huh. What would be the political landscape in Lebanon if that happens? Oh, well, um, in that case, I'm going to be very happy that the neighborhood I happen to live in, which is, you know, we live in the neighborhood which is two blocks away from Mr. Hariri's compound, <laughs> it's, it, and, and it's barricaded and the army is there. I think we're going to feel very, very safe and very secure <laughs> if he comes back. 
Um, no, I think if, you, if, if Hariri comes back, I think it, would, it will actually um, be an important change to the la landscape. I don't think it's you know, necessarily a totally destabilizing event, but it, it will be a major event, and it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Yeah. All right, well, how things evolve will be interesting no matter what. This is a really complicated, multi-layered topic. Thanks, Irina, for coming back and sharing your insights as someone on the ground, experiencing things day to day. Thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking Irina once again. Thank you.